get started. And I'm so grateful to see so many people interested in this really important topic. Um, today, uh, you have joined, uh, welcome this ATS webinar, webinar on fluids and vasopressors and septic shock, particularly in light of the recent New England Journal Clover's trial, it was published back in February, and particularly with a view to understanding its implications in different clinical contexts around the world. My name is Beth Riviello, and I am a pulmonary and critical care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School in Boston. I'm actually currently calling in from Rwanda, where I'm working with critical care colleagues from Rwanda, Kenya, and Malawi. So today's topic is particularly relevant from where I sit. And I will be co-chairing this session with Dr. Dingasi Dula, who I hope will be joining us momentarily, and she'll certainly be with us for the questions and discussion. Um, she is a physician at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre, Malawi. We are thrilled to have four distinguished speakers from around the world to discuss the CLOVER's trial of fluid management and sepsis. They'll give their perspective on the trial, as well as a perspective on their own clinical practice of fluid resuscitation in each of their contexts. And after we hear from the speakers, they're all available for questions and discussions afterward, which I think will be a really rich time. So I hope people are able to stay. So today we are privileged to hear from Dr. Nathan Shapiro. He is the first author of the Clover's trial. He hails from my own institution, Beth Israel and Harvard Medical School in Boston. Also from Dr. Teojen Twagiru Mugabe, who is my friend and colleague and mentor. He is from the University of Rwanda and the University Teaching Hospital of Butare in Rwanda. We also have another friend and colleague and mentor, Dr. Juliana Ferreira from the Federal University of Sao Paulo and Sao Paulo Hospital in Brazil, and Dr. Nagarajan Ramakrishnan from Apollo Hospitals in Chennai, India. So a really illustrious group, and I'm really looking forward to this, and I thank you all for joining. We'll now go to the talks and then followed by discussion and questions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Nathan Shapiro. I'm coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. And for the next little bit, we're going to be talking about clovers and its precursors, bringing over a history and update on the evidence for vasopressors versus fluid in septic shock. If we think about the two approaches, we'll call them liberal versus conservative or restrictive fluids, each has theoretical advantages. For liberal fluids, you augment preload to increase cardiac output and organ perfusion. You do this uh, with fluids, sparing the use of vasopressors and its associated detrimental effects. There's pretty good preclinical evidence out there and some empiric clinical evidence that fluids will increase microcirculatory flow. And as we'll discuss in a few minutes, one might say it's um, a current empiric approach that's been used over the last five to 10 years, give or take. When we think about the conservative or restrictive fluids approach, the idea is you reduce overall fluids and positive fluid balance. You're really using uh, chemical vasopressors to treat vasodilation, and you're preventing worsening of pathologic edema, um, which happens during sepsis. Finally, there's a lot of observational studies that show an association between fluid balance and poor outcomes. So this is just a list of a handful of the, the studies showing negative fluid balance or lower fluids associated with better outcomes. And germane to this talk, there's also a, a randomized clinical trial out there in Sub-Saharan Africa, which was in children. Um, I'm sure this audience will probably be quite familiar with this, at least by the end of this talk or by a set of talks that we will be. Uh, that really was an RCT that showed that no bolus, first albumin bolus or saline bolus, had much better outcomes. So this is pretty good empiric evidence. I'd also like to just, for the purpose of this talk, and we'll allude to this later, bring up this study as well by Andrews et al. And this was <clears throat> in an austere environment as well. And it took it, the, I, the general hypothesis was let's take a sepsis protocol with fluids and vasopressors and in a pragmatic way, um, administer it in um, austere environments. And in this RCT, it turned out the usual care that didn't really mobilize vasopressors and fluids ended up with better outcomes. So data in support of a conservative approach or restrictive approach? Well, 
first and foremost, observational studies, finding this association between fluid volume and adverse outcomes. However, there, we have to really take a strong caution in that there's confounding by indication, potentially, in the sense that if patients are sick, we're going to try and escalate therapy. We're going to try and give them more fluids. So it's possible fluid administration is just a really, really good biomarker of illness severity. And of course, we all know that association does not equal causation. However, the strongest data in support is the FEAST trial. So thinking a little bit about the history of CLOVERS, um, which was a study that I helped lead, uh, supported by NHLBI and conducted by the Pedal Network, um, thinking about that, really, its roots are probably grounded in the Rivers trial, which back in 2001 was a study that showed aggressive early protocolized resuscitation, which facilitated an early and aggressive resuscitation led to better outcomes. Here, using a protocol, patients ended up with more fluids um, as a mainstay of the therapy that was given, and we saw better outcomes. Fast forward about a decade and process promise and arise were trials that sought to validate goal-directed therapy and essentially found that a decade later, um, the, the outcomes were no better in patients with or without a protocol. However, I'd also like to point out as we look at these trials that the mortality rates of both the treatment and the control group in the Rivers trial and similar trials like it at the time were much higher than what we saw in process promise and arise. So what's interesting is if we look at the usual care groups, mortality is much lower a decade later. And it's fair to say that in uh, the clinical setting, we were using a lot more fluids. If you look at process promise and arise, and if we look at the difference between the, the amount of fluids given, here we saw that the treatment uh, or the protocol group and the non-protocol group really ended up with similar amounts of fluids. Um, if we look over 72 hours, it was 8.7 versus 8.8 .8 liters of fluids, 8.7 versus 9.5, 7.8 versus 7.6. So really high volume resuscitations that we saw in process promise and arise, which was a, again, a precursor to clovers. So really that said, with these observational trials we saw and just general clinical wisdom, we were it was a, almost a swinging pendulum, which was the impetus for clovers in the sense that prior to rivers, we gave a lot of fluid. We didn't give so much fluids. Then with rivers and subsequent um, protocols, surviving sepsis campaign with initial fluid bolus, we started giving a lot more fluids. And then there was a call to say, maybe we've swung too far. And that was really the place and time for the Clovers trial. Here's the um, citation from the, the New England Journal. I like to acknowledge the investigative team without which uh, the study could not have happened. And let's dive into Clovers. So the hypothesis of Clovers was really that a restrictive, which we best described as vasopressors followed by rescue fluids versus a liberal resuscitation fluid resuscitation fluids followed by rescue vasopressors would reduce 90-day mortality before discharge home in sepsis-induced hypotension. It was a multi-center prospective phase three trial, non-blinded. The intervention was a 24-hour fluid and vasopressor titration protocol, one favoring less fluids and earlier use of vasopressors compared to the other with more fluids and later use of vasopressors. Primary outcome mortality prior to discharge home, we planned on 2,320 patients to enroll, and there was a planned DSMB interim analysis at one third, two thirds, and final. This was conducted by the NHLBI sponsored pedal network. 12 clinical hubs and 60 hospitals participated in Clovers. The inclusion criteria were adult patients with suspected or confirmed infection and hypotension, which we defined as blood pressure less than 100 or MAP less than 65 after a minimum of one liter um, fluid challenge. Exclusion, first and foremost, more than four hours elapsed since meeting inclusion criteria. The goal was to get to these patients early, 24 hours um, since presentation in the hospital, and if they received over three liters, uh, they weren't eligible because we felt that that was too far along a liberal protocol. And if it was, hypotension due to non-sepsis causes. Um, and finally, the, tr the treating clinician had to be willing to randomize the patient to either arm, either 
arm had to be uh, okay with the, the treating clinicians. If a patient was profoundly dehydrated, then the clinician might say that they weren't willing to go to a restrictive arm and those patients wouldn't be included. Uh, because of time, I'm going to have to just breeze through the protocols, but this is really where the action was at. The restrictive protocol essentially said stop giving fluids and use vasopressors, but I do want to point out that there was the opportunity for what we call rescue fluids, which were clinical criteria where we felt that addition, that a rescue fluid bolus would be clinically indicated. And finally, I'd also like to point out that rescue fluids could be administered at any time at the discretion of the clinical team if they felt that it was in the best interest of the patient. Conversely, for the fluid liberal approach, the first thing we did was actually give um, a two liter infusion with a pause after a liter to see if the second liter was warranted in order to initiate the fluid protocol. And here, same idea, rescue vasopressors um, could be used if they were, uh, if patients met criteria or the clinicians felt like it was in the best interest of a patient. And at five liters, we said that that's pro you probably realize a liberal flow protocol. So the trial was stopped for futility at planned second interim analysis, 1,563 patients enrolled, typical demographics. I'd like to highlight that time uh, to enrollment in the time from eligibility to randomization was 60 minutes. 92% were enrolled in the emergency department and on average patients got two liters in each group prior to entering the protocol. So did we have a clinical trial? We'd submit yes. Patients had more fluids in the liberal group compared to the restrictive. If we look at the 24 hour protocol period, it was 1267 to 3400, or just overall including pre-randomization 3300 to 5400, so about a two liter difference. Patients in the restrictive group got um, vasopressors more often earlier, and there was longer use of them. And at the end of the day, the, the trial was stopped at the second interim analysis, um, with no difference between the groups. Overall mortality, 14% compared to 14.9%. There was no difference in secondary outcomes, such as 28-day organ support-free days, ventilator-free days, or hospital-free days. If we looked at things such as Cadego score, SOFA score, new intubation with mechanical ventilation, no difference between the groups. Really, it was flat as far as looking for different differences between the groups. Um, there was only a difference of two serious adverse events. Uh, we would like to highlight that while this wasn't tested test in a randomized way, um, va peripheral vasopressors were allowed in both arms. This was pre-specified in the protocol. And amongst a total of um, 500 patients uh, who had vasopressors, there was only three complications. So these are data in support of the use of peripheral vasopressors. And the conclusion of Clover's was fluid restrictive strategy as compared to fluid liberal strategy using this trial did not result in lower or higher mortality prior to discharge home before day 90 in patients with sepsis induced hypotension. So either approach um, when used in a similar population looks to have been equally effective. So just in terms of discussion, this was in a US population, neither approach was superior. Uh, it's still with caution as to how Clover's generalize it to other settings. As we saw, we have data um, from the FEAST trial. We also have data where, where it just was a really reasonable hypothesis that a sepsis protocol would be a good idea. So we're gonna have to, as a purist say, similar studies are warranted to inform the practice. And I think the idea is good clinical titration at the bedside is gonna be your best approach either way. Thank you for this opportunity. I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on the location where you are. My name is Theogen Tagir Mugabe, and I'm an anesthesiologist and intensivist from the uh, University of Rwanda. I have been tasked by the ATS Global Health to talk about the IV fluid management of vasopressors in early septic shock resuscitation on a perspective from a low-income country like Rwanda. First of all, I want to disclose that I have no conflict of interest related to this presentation. 
And as we are all away, subsidies is prevalent across the entire globe. As over 49 million of new cases per year are registered, and of them, 20% or more may die from sepsis or its complication. The vast majority of septic patients are decoded in low-income country, and so are the vast majority of this related to sepsis or its complications. As you are aware, in its essence, sepsis and septic shock are associated with hypovolemia, either effective or relative. And therefore, fluid resuscitation is among the key management of sepsis and septic shock, especially in early stage of sepsis or septic shock. These fluid protocols have shown an improvement on outcome, especially in high income countries with a an important decline of the mortality that has been registered since the year 2000. You all know the area goal directed therapy uh, study that has been conducted by Emmanuel Rivals and co researchers, which has shown an important reduction of sepsis induced mortality in the early goal-directed therapy group compared to the usual KM. And since 2001, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign has been issuing guidelines on the management of sepsis, especially at early stage, including an emphasis on IV fluid management. And the most recent still recommends at least that milliliters of uh, balance uh, IV fluid or crystalloid per kg for the first three hours. But this is not supposed, supported by a strong uh, quality of evidence. In fact, different other clinical trials comparing the IRI core directed therapy have shown no difference between this arrival direct therapy compared to the usual care. But despite that, this recommendation of the surviving sepsis campaign still stand on the IV fluid. When it comes to low income countries, despite limited number of clinical trials in that perspective, there are two studies that have been conducted in low-income countries, the clinical trials, one on pediatric patients conducted in East African countries comparing a bolus of 20 to 40 milliliters per kg of normosaline or albumin to no bolus at all. And another one conducted in uh, accident and emergency department in uh, Zambia comparing uh, a similar to early goal directed therapy to usual care, and both of them did not show any benefit of uh, protocolized IV fluid, but rather in the deleterious effect with a significantly increased mortality among patients with protocolized IV fluid compared to the usual care. And from these findings, one could uh, argue that the rationale behind this high mortality with liberal IV fluid in low income country may be due to pre existing comorbidity. As patients from the Zambian trial were mostly having HIV, and HIV is generally complicated with non communicable diseases, including heart failure other dilated cardiomyopathy that may not uh, be a uh, benefit from excessive IV fluid. Moreover, most of the patients also were having hypoalbuminemia or malnutrition. On the other hand, 
most of cases in uh, low income country, especially those with sepsis, consult a little bit late. And we can hypothesize that uh, at uh, delayed management, majority of patients may have a sepsis induced cardiomyopathy that may involve they may involve the right ventricle failure or diastolic dysfunction, which does not also benefit from excessive IV fluids. Also, the delayed consultation may also bring a, an extensive capillary leak that may predispose to a higher risk of organ failure, including pulmonary edema in settings where the access to ventilator is uh, elusive. But last but not least, the case mix of uh, septic patient in low income country may also have some particularity with the highest uh, source of infection sepsis being uh, respiratory and pneumonia, but also intra-abdominal sepsis is among the commonest and followed by the central nervous system and uh, immediate postpartum uh, sepsis are the commonest. However, when we look at the intra-abdominal sepsis and uh, the pathophysiology behind, including lack of oral intake for quite a while and uh, associated with vomiting, fever, and uh, fat spacing, one can uh, hypothesize that this category of patient may benefit from excessive IV fluid management even more than the one recommended by the surviving sepsis campaign. But this could be the, not be the case for patient with pneumonia or meningitis or patient with immediate postpartum sepsis. So given that the high disparities of patient uh, source of sepsis in low income country, one could recommend that uh, in the vast majority excessive fluid uh, management administration may be deleterious, but also restrictive fluid management may be insufficient for some cases like the one of intra-abdominal sepsis. Therefore, it is recommendable that initial IV fluid policies can be coupled with fluid responsiveness assessment by dynamic variable, including passive leg raise testing, but also the cardiography that measure the inferior vena cover diameter and its collapsibility and the pulse pressure variation with respiratory cycles. This can be supported by a recent uh, unblinded randomized clinical trial, which compared the restrictive IV fluids, giving uh, priority to vasopressors instead of excessive IV fluids compared to the liberal IV fluids, where in this protocol, Clinicians were allowed to use echocardiographic and dynamic or clinical indicators to assess the extreme hypovolemia of fluid overload and use the findings to guide fluid vasopressor prescription in either arm. From this study, it has been found that there was no difference in terms of mortality at day 90 between the two groups, except in some subgroup of patients especially those with end-stage renal disease and somehow black uh, patient. And from this, we can conclude that one size fits or IV fluid strategy doesn't stand in low-income settings. And it would rather give room to initial IV bolus followed by the point of care ultrasound assessment to identify patients who may benefit from more fluid and those who may not. 
and guide this IV fluid resuscitation through this dynamic monitoring. But another uh, other study, if they are to be undertaken, we should recommend that patient selection should take into consideration the specificities of source of sepsis, as some may benefit from uh, excessive IV fluid, while others may not. But also the clinical trial that can be conducted should also take into consideration the delayed in management of substance as some complications may have been prevailing and uh, can also uh, mask the benefit or the harm, harmfulness of some uh, IV fluid strategies. Among those, we have to, when considering future clinical trial, we have also to consider uh, identifying patient with sepsis induced cardiomyopathy and for the analysis, adjust for this uh, important uh, clinical condition as well. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Juliana Ferreira from the University of Sao Paulo. And I'm going to discuss the emphasis on fluids or vasopressors to treat shock and a perspective from Brazil. This is my disclosure for this presentation. The burden of sepsis is higher in low and middle income countries where scarcity of ICU beds, equipment and specialized healthcare workers limits access to ICU and impacts outcomes. Christina Rudd and co-workers looked at more than 100 million deaths from the Global Burden of Disease database to estimate global, regional, and national incidence and mortality of sepsis. And this is a graphical view of their main findings. The good news is the incidence fell from 1990 to 2017, but the colors of the map with darker blue representing higher incidence show that the incidence varies tremendously across the globe and that lower middle income countries have a higher burden of sepsis. Mortality also fell by more than 50% in recent years. And again, with darker blue representing higher mortality rates, we can see that low and middle income countries have considerably higher mortality than high income countries. And here I highlight the number of deaths per 100,000 population for the countries of the panelists of the session. We can see that there is a lot of discrepancy and in many African countries, the mortality rate is 10 times higher than that in the US. Among the many challenges to treating sepsis in low and middle income countries is the lack of protocols and clinical guidelines that are applicable to the local context. Adopting treatment protocols from high income countries can lead to, an, to unexpected outcomes, as was the case with using early goal directed therapy in randomized trials in adults and children in Africa. Brazil has epidemiological studies that can help understand the burden of disease and inform treatment protocols. This is the SPREAD study organized by the uh, Latin American Sepsis Institute network that included patients in 317 ICUs, more than 2,000 patients, and uh, they found that 30% of the patients in the ICUs they surveyed had sepsis on the day of the study and 56% died. Interestingly, organ dispersion at ICU admission, low availability of resources, and adequacy of treatment at admission uh, were associated with higher mortality. This is the fluid trip study. It's a sub-study of a larger global study looking at um, fluid uh, practices across the globe. Uh, more than 400 ICUs participated in the study and about half of the patients were from ICUs in Brazil. Therefore, this sub-study is a comparison of uh, fluid practices in Brazilian patients compared with the rest of the world. Uh, this is data from 2014, 
And as you can see, crystalloids were much common in Brazil compared to all of the other countries, with sodium chloride being the most popular type of crystalloid chosen. Balanced solutions were also less common in Brazil compared to the rest of the world, as were colloids, which were much rarer or more rarely used in Brazil compared with other countries. It is very likely that the, the uh, fluid practices that we saw in the previous study are a reflection of costs. As we can see here, the costs of um, sodium chloride in, in Brazil compared to Ringer's lactate, norepinephrine, and plasma light are much different, with plasma light being more expensive than using norepinephrine, for example. So it makes sense that in most ICUs where resources are scarce, that clinicians would choose sodium chloride as the first or the most important form for resuscitation and shock and sepsis. Then it's good news that the BASICS randomized control trial, which was um, implemented in 75 ICUs across Brazil and compared balanced crystalloids with common saline, found that the mortality rate was similar for patients receiving uh, either um, types, types of resuscitation. And because it was performed in Brazil, we can feel confident that the results apply to Brazilian ICUs. So what are the implications of the Clo Clover's trial for Brazil in terms of um, managing patients with shock? I think the biggest take home message from that study is the opportunity for, for ICUs in low and middle income countries to develop treatment protocols that are tailored to their local infrastructure. Since there are no differences in mortality with, with treatment protocols using a liberal or a restrictive fluid strategy, uh, ICUs can, or countries can choose what is the best approach for them based on the availability of vasopressors, uh, the types of crystalloids available, and also the availability of um, healthcare workers. The pragmatic approach of the Clovis trial has other implications for Brazil and other low- and middle-income countries. The demonstration of safety and efficacy of administering vasopressors initially through a peripheral intravenous catheter is, can be a big advantage. If ICUs um, have shortages of catheters or a high cost for centrovenous catheters, or they have a, a reduced number of healthcare workers per ICU bed, this could delay the insertion of centrovenous catheters and then impact outcomes. If there is the possibility of initiating vasopressors through a peripheral catheter, then we can reduce time for initiation of resuscitation and shock reversal and therefore impact outcomes. Also, in the CLOVERS trial, both groups used non-invasive and widely available clinical and laboratory parameters to um, assess response to treatments such as blood pressure, heart rate, and lactate um, measurements. There's, these are available in, in most middle-income countries like Brazil, so this is also one of the reasons why this trial can be implemented in countries like Brazil. For ICUs in middle-income countries uh, like Brazil, where both vasopressors and, and crystalloids and fluids are available, but the ratio of ICU nurse per bed is reduced, a restrictive fluid strategy similar to the one used in the Clover's trial can be advantageous. This is an example of a, using a restrictive strategy uh, in an ICU in Brazil. You initiate with fluid resuscitation, then reassess the patient. If adequate levels of blood pressure and tissue perfusion are not met, a vasopressor can be um, initiated through a peripheral line, and then the patient continues to be monitored. If the patient continues to need vasopressor for more than six hours, or needs an increasing dose of vasopressors, or needs develops other types of uh, organ dysfunction and needs advanced life support, then you have time to insert a centrovenous line. 
This strategy could uh, result in less use of centrovenous lines as many patients might not um, uh, come to this situation down here and respond to an initial a small dose of vasopressor to a peripheral line, but also if they do need the central venous line, you have time uh, to prepare for that and not let um, the lack of resources delay initiation of treatment. To summarize, we need local epidemiological data and implementation studies that help develop regional guidelines and we also need to monitor, monitor ICU indicators to inform the best strategy to deal with sepsis and septic shock in a given ICU. With the final goals of reversing septic shock, optimizing interprofessional care, avoiding complication and impacting patient-centered outcomes, while also providing a rational and equitable resource allocation. Thank you for your attention. Hi, uh, I am Dr. N. Ramakrishnan from uh, Chennai, India, and I will be providing an Indian perspective on whether we should be emphasizing fluids or vasopressors in septic shock. I would like to start with a disclosure that I do not have any conflicts of interest uh, relating to this topic. And I would also like to acknowledge three of my colleagues who have very graciously shared their uh, slides and presentations and the studies that they have published. Dr. Suchitra Ranjit, my uh, pediatric intensivist colleague, Dr. Ramesh Venkatraman, and Dr. Ajay Padmanabhan, both who are adult intensivists. I'm not planning to review the entire literature on vasopressors versus fluids in shock because that would probably be overlapping and be a repetition of concepts presented by other speakers. I will be focusing only on a few studies done in India and outline the rationale for our preferred options. When I say India, I want to clarify that India is a very large and diverse country. And as you can see, the healthcare, right from the number of people per bed and the number of government or public hospital beds that are available are very variable between the different states in the country. But interestingly, private sector is 58% of the hospitals in the country and 29% of the beds and 81% of the doctors are in private sector. The private sector is the primary source for healthcare for a predominant 70% of the household in urban areas, and also about 63% in the rural areas. Without reading the numbers, you can also see that there are a large number of private hospitals which cater to most of the beds and the ICU beds and the ventilators that are available in the country. But everything that we do here is actually a balancing act, trying to provide high quality care but more importantly, access to whatever is required to provide that level of evidence-based high quality care and provide this in a very cost effective manner. It's a very cost sensitive market and therefore every decision that we make has to be sensitive to the cost of the care. With that being said, I will move on to the science of the traditional teaching on fluids. When we think about crystalloids versus colloids, the first thought that comes to our mind is the fact that when we give crystalloids a liter of crystalloid, about 250 ml of that may remain in the intravascular space, whereas a predominant amount, almost about 750 ml, might be in the extravascular space. And therefore, we wonder whether we should be using colloids for resuscitation where a significant proportion remains in the intravascular space and much lesser in the extravascular space. This is a study that all of us know, the SAFE study, which looked at comparing albumin versus saline and clearly demonstrated that the outcomes were no different when we used colloids versus crystalloids, whether we looked at survival time, 
organ dysfunction, duration of mechanical ventilation, duration of renal replacement therapy, ICU length of stay, or hospital length of stay. So whatever fluid we decide to give, will that help or cause harm? Now, anything in medicine, if we give it appropriately, would help. And if we give it inappropriately, it's more likely to cause harm. So I would definitely give fluid if there is clear symptom and signs and objective features showing that the patient would benefit from fluids, whether it is looking at the IVC collapsibility or any other methods where we feel that the patient is volume deficit and would benefit from the fluids. If, on the other hand, I have any of the features suggesting that the patient is probably getting overloaded, then I would definitely stop resuscitation. But there are situations when we look both at the fluid responsiveness and the fluid tolerance, and we have to individualize to the context to weigh the risk versus benefit of giving fluid. Now, when do we really stop giving fluids? If a patient is fluid responsive, and fluid tolerant, certainly I would give fluid. On the contrary, if the patient is not fluid responsive and is not tolerating the fluids, then I would certainly stop. But we need to look at the clinical context and assess the best risk versus benefit if we are unclear about the fluid responsiveness and the fluid tolerance. The goal whenever we are giving fluid is certainly to see whether we can increase the stroke volume without increasing the extravascular lung volume. And we are all familiar with this graph where there is a certain portion in the graph where we can probably give the appropriate fluid to just increase the stroke volume without increasing extravascular lung water. And beyond that, we're probably going to cause more harm. So in summary, colloids do not reduce fluid requirement significantly. Hyperoncotic colloids should not be used. Hydroxyethyl starches can increase the risk of acute kidney injury, renal replacement therapy, and mortality. And we certainly want to use balanced risk colloids to avoid hyperchloremia. Now, in the context of India, when we think about these different fluids, a liter of saline costs about a dollar or more. Albumin, on the other hand, costs almost close to $100. And if I decide to use vasopressors, as you can see, depending on the minimum to maximum dose that I may use, we are talking about close to $10 to $15, even at high doses that we may have to use to maintain the hemodynamics. Despite all of this, I think we, most of us, would probably give fluids as suggested by most yeah. guidelines as the first step, because it's probably reasonable and in any setting is probably the easiest, cheapest and fastest way to stabilize circulation, but more importantly, also buys time until the next step is determined. I would like to acknowledge that this study was published in Pediatric Critical Care Medicine by our colleagues, Dr. Suchitra Ranjit and several others in India, who looked at variability in the hemodynamic response to fluid bolus given in pediatric septic shock. And clearly demonstrated that fluid bolus therapy in shock, while aiming to improve the cardiac output, does have several adverse and unpredictable consequences. As you can see, it can cause several issues, multi-organ dysfunctions, including myocardial ischemia, edema, hepatic condition, gut edema, pulmonary edema, cerebral edema, and a lot more. And waiting for fluid overload may not really be the smartest strategy. And giving very aggressive fluid therapy in the initial few hours can probably keep the ICU busy for the next several days, as shown by Dr. Suchitra Ranjit and group because they demonstrated that when we do this, there is a much higher need for rescue ventilation, much higher need for using higher doses of ionotropes and pressors. There's also a greater need for rescue dialysis and renal replacement therapies and longer ICU stays and overall worse outcomes.
So in the pediatric age group, in a viewpoint that they wrote in Lancet Child and Adolescent Health, Dr. Ranjit and others mentioned clearly that early initiation of vasoactivations can confer several benefits, including sustained increments in cardiac output, less positive fluid balance, shortened duration of hypotension and organ hypoperfusion, and improved urine output and lactate clearance. So in summary so far, in India, I would use fluids, which are less expensive, the crystalloids, and initiate vasopressors early. We also worked on checking whether the vasopressors could be safely administered through peripheral intravenous access, because central venous access, again, may not always be available in all the settings, and more importantly, uh, also has its associated costs, including risks of infection. So our group uh, with Dr. Ajay Padmanabhan as the lead looked at whether we could safely administer vasopressors through the peripheral venous catheters. We looked at 122 patients who had almost 178 peripheral lines. And as you can see, there were different uh, gauges that were used and different sites that were used. And in most patients, noradrenaline or norepinephrine was the predominant vasopressor that was used. And there were a few who also received adrenaline dopamine or noradrenaline plus vasopressin, which was the second highest number, and noradrenaline along with adrenaline in some of the patients. Most patients on an average receive vasopressors through the peripheral IV for approximately about 12 hours. And the maximum duration for which vasopressors were administered through the peripheral IV was close to 88 hours. As you can see here, triple vasopressors were never used and vasopressin alone was never used in the peripheral IV. The complications were very minimal. Only one peripheral vascular catheter related complication was noted. Most others did not have any significant infection or complication relating to the peripheral IV administration of vasopressors. So our group in this study concluded that vasopressors when used through peripheral venous catheters with an 18 gauge or larger caliber seem to be effective and safe. And the complications were fairly minimal. And we could consider vasopressor infusion at moderate doses through a peripheral venous catheter with careful monitoring in resource limited settings where we may not always be able to place a central venous catheter and more importantly, also comes with its associated costs. Overall, based on the three studies that I have shown, I would like to say or conclude that healthcare system in India is widely variable across urban and rural areas, government and private sectors, and also in the different states. Balancing cost, benefit, and availability plays a key role in the decisions on treatment. Crystalloids as fluids should be used initially, but we really recommend early initiation of vasopressor and limiting what we call excessive fluids. And again, that's a call that we need to take based on some objective criteria and also with the goal of preventing complications. We do use peripheral intravenous access and avoid center line if possible. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. That was incredibly interesting and a, a really helpful and diverse look at the implications of clovers as well as the, the trials that have been done prior to clovers. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to start off just by sharing one more perspective. As I mentioned, Dr. Dingasi Dula at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre is my co-chair and is unable to be with us due to technical difficulties. And she had shared with me yet another practical look at this. I think in some ways what Clovers does is maybe perhaps give a bit of freedom that it's okay to do one or the other. 
Um, and it, two of our speakers sort of came down on the side that maybe restrictive on average is, is a, a more feasible way to go given the option. And she expressed that the, at her hospital in Malawi, they went very much in detail through uh, Dr. Andrew's study uh, in JAMA in Zambia. And they actually did not um, start doing less fluids based on that study because the practicality of giving pressors in the wards um, was not there. Um, and it's not just about extravasation and about central lines and peripheral lines, but also about the lack of IV pumps and the ability to drip uh, at, a, at a standard rate and be able to monitor and be able to give pressors safely. So I, I thought that was another interesting perspective as you look at the various practical implications in different contexts. Um, so thank you. I, this has come up in the chat, and this was also something I was hoping um, any of the speakers or all of them would address. It does seem as though um, we are coming again to the point of the not only the, the clinical context, but the context of the patient and fluid responsiveness and, and should we be looking at the bedside. And as far as I know, there is yet to be a definitive study that says using a particular method for fluid responsiveness changes outcomes in terms of guiding fluid management. And I would just love to hear uh, people's perspectives on uh, current practice, but also how could we best get to that answer? If that's our next question, now that we have this answer, um, how could we best answer that question about whether we need to be guiding fluid resuscitation on particular parameters with patients? I could uh, start off by making the comment. So, um, I mean, really, and this was the question with Clovers is, the real question is, is what I'm doing now to the patient in front of me now, using the parameters that I see now, going to lead to better outcomes for them over the next days to weeks, right? So in other words, if I have a patient and I do an echo and it shows that it looks like they're under resuscitated, if I give fluids in order to co 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 correct that um, particular deficit now, is that gonna lead to better outcomes? And so the, the natural hypothesis would be, let's use something like some strategy to assess volume responsiveness and then fix it. But it's also possible that fixing volume responsiveness is just simply not the right direction to go as logical as that hypothesis would be. So at the end of the day, and th this was the whole question with, with Clovers, which is if I give have a patient and I'm giving fluids, I'm making the blood pressure normal, but is that good? Is it good to make the blood pressure normal? Is it possible that an abnormal blood pressure actually has some sort of adaptive response? We don't know. Um, again, we what we rely on the physiology at the bedside. So at the end of the day, we have a hypothesis that says that using some sort of flow-mediated resuscitation or some sort of monitoring, if we use that to guide our resuscitation, we'll get to better outcomes. We just need to test it. So one group needs to get this and one group needs to not get this and we need to see weeks from now who who's done better. That's at least my perspective. Thank you. Others? Yeah, if I may add, I, I too agree. I mean, like, it sounds very scientific to kind of say, you know, like I'm looking at fluid responsiveness, I'm looking at fluid, you know, tolerance, but really when it comes to doing it at the bedside, it's A, it's not easy, and B, I don't know whether we have one parameter that we can use, to go and say that, you know, I'm happy that the patient is now fluid responsive. I don't think we have any such, in, in fact, even something like the blood pressure, I don't know if we know what is the right blood pressure or what is the right mean arterial pressure that we, we all go by the golden 65, but do we need 65? Do we need 60? We don't even know what it is. So I think if at all there's something that we should go by, it should be the clinical perfusion, uh, whether the patient looks more perfused, I mean, as far as the urine output, as far as the mental status, little things that we can assess at the bedside and opposite of that for the fluid tolerance. I mean, if the patient is sounding congested, I mean, you're probably already missing the boat if we go that far, but still, you know, those are the things that we would go by, but I don't think there's a magic way to assess the same. Thank you so much. I can only agree with my colleagues, but I in fact, although we need guidelines, but guidelines may not apply to every single patient. So that's why we need to have a kind of individualized patient care, even though guidelines are there to help to guide you know, the treatment. But when, when it comes to IV fluid in particular patients, especially in low-income countries, so many patients may respond quite differently. 
for several reasons. I have mentioned just a very few in terms of source of sepsis, but also in terms of delay to show up to the hospital. So it's quite a little bit challenging. And uh, I agree that there is no magic blood pressure that can predict the survival. And I think there are some studies that have shown that even increasing the target of blood pressure beyond 65 millimeters of mercury doesn't improve the outcome, even for patients with uh, pre-existing hypertension. So it is still something that needs to be explored. But again, as I mentioned, if there are some clinical trials to be conducted, they have to be a little bit specific and try to address some of the issues that may uh, be behind the failure of IV fluid or behind uh, the, the responsiveness of the IV fluid uh, in septic patient. Thank you. Yeah, I think maybe the reason we don't have a clinical trial in that topic is because maybe it's very hard to test. The clinician at the bedside wants to see a result, uh, blood pressure, uh, heart rate, or maybe capillary filling, uh, decrease in lactate. So I think it's really hard to, I don't really see how we could randomize um, patients to different types of monitoring. I, for example, we, I, 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 I really trust the leg raising strategy to see fluid responsiveness, but it's not really applicable if the patient is not on mechanical ventilation, for example. So it's not um, very useful in a lot of conditions, especially in the first hours. So I suppose, I, th I, suppose, I think the Clovis trial really um, gives me confidence that maybe we don't need all that, um, I, that granularity in terms of um, monitoring everything and then uh, going either way to resuscitate the patient in the first hours. Great, thank you all. Um, as you've been talking, we've had a, a very active chat group here. Um, Dr. Schwartzstein, early on in this, in this particular discussion, wondered about the role of lactate and giving some data showing that high lactate is ominous for poor mitochondrial function or poor perfusion. Um, and also perhaps other evidences of poor end organ perfusion like CNS fu function or urine output. Uh, I think in other words, some other parameters besides blood pressure. What do people have thoughts on those other parameters in addition to blood pressure or instead of? I mentioned that that's what we use on the bedside, you know, on the clinical perfusion and looking at the urine output and metal status. I think that's probably what was reinforced. Yeah, yeah, great. Dr. Edwin from uh, Uganda um, has said, we've been focusing on the microbiology of sepsis more than the IV fluids or pressors, but most of our patients don't achieve a systolic blood pressure greater than 100 until maybe day three or four. Since TB is the commonest cause of sepsis here, we think about adrenal insufficiency, but there is no literature supporting the use of steroids in hypotensive HIV positive patients in Africa. I think it's an extremely important point in places where TB is endemic and often can be the most common cause of sepsis. Do, do people have experience or thoughts in terms of looking at TB sepsis different from perhaps bacterial sepsis? I mean, um, tuberculosis can be present along with sepsis due to some other reason. Tuberculosis per se causing an acute sepsis or severe septic shock is not that common. I mean, that's more a chronic infection that we see. So yes, I mean, even in India, we do have patients with tuberculosis, but that's in the background. So I totally agree with the thought that if somebody who is admitted with sepsis, septic shock, and remains hypotensive, uh, my chances of using a steroid earlier, hydrocortisone, may come to mind if we also have a suspicion of an underlying tuberculosis, which could be affecting that dream. But uh, tuberculosis per se causing acute severe sepsis septic shock is extremely uncommon in my opinion, but I would stand corrected if it is different in Africa. Yeah, and I think in the, the study in Zambia, it was a very large proportion of patients who had uh, tuberculosis in their in the blood tests, not not just pulmonary, but it's unclear if there was always, always an acute sepsis cause on top of that tuberculosis, but maybe nonetheless, the underlying TB can have an impact on how people respond to fluids and pressors. Yeah, great. 
lot of interest in um, in how people are uh, assessing fluid responsiveness. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to describe what you truly do at the bedside. I know uh, Dama, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan has already said, I think somewhat in your talk, the details of how you assess that. Others have sort of your day-to-day -day favorite way to assess fluid responsiveness, if so, or, or to, to make judgments based on the clinical context of the patient. We do use lactate trends in Brazil, but it takes, I mean, you have to wait a few hours to do that. So on top of blood pressure and heart rate, we use capillary filling is also very popular for some reason in Brazil. Although I think that's a little, um, it can be very subjective if you don't know how you do it. And we, we do use, I think um, Theo mentioned that, we use echo as well to, to see uh, the vena cava and signs of um, excess fluids or lack of fluids. I think it's, you can trust it when you're in one of the extremes. I think when you're halfway, not so good, but a combination of those. I think with the young generation, they do like the echo. So as far as they can, they can manipulate the echo and do the collapsibility of the IVC. If there is a possibility to get the more advanced skills for the echo, you can check for the TDI, but it's not quite common in low income settings. But with the echo, uh, pass, uh, passive elevation of the legs, you can also look at the plasticomography and see the variation of the, the curve, and it can give you an idea how uh, responsive may be your patient. I think okay. there are some studies, several studies that have been published on the uh, oximeter variability or plasticomography variability with the respiration, especially for ventilated patients. Great. Great. Thank you. There were just a couple of very specific questions, I think, for Dr. Shapiro about the study. Um, one was asking why five liters was chosen as the maximum for fluid resuscitation. Um, and I think that that's an important and interesting question, given that the total amount, certainly you know, not only the difference, but what are we talking about in terms of totals in either arm? Um, and then the second specific question was the average dose of vasopressors in peripheral IVs. Yeah, so both great questions. For the five liters, it was honestly a consensus as to, we asked the question amongst the group designing the study, what would we consider to be, you've had enough fluid, you're, you're, you've achieved the fl uh, liberal fluid resuscitation. And we set, looked a little bit at the data. So the Rivers trial on average, gold rectal therapy group got about five liters. And ultimately that's just where we settled. We said, if once somebody has hit the five liter mark, we're gonna consider that a, a, a liberal fluid resuscitation. So it was a little bit of data and honestly, a little bit of clinical consensus. We said, if we push it to six or seven, that starts to sound really high. Four, maybe you're not quite getting there considering that patient's got two liters to begin with. So. That, that's what, how we landed on five. So not super scientific, but we tried to base it a little bit in pragmatism. And then we, unfortunately, we didn't get the, because the dosing was going to be up and down and side to side, we decided uh, not to collect the exact dosing of the um, vasopressor. So unfortunately, we don't have that. So great. both great questions. Really nice to hear all the sausages made for the, the planning of clinical yeah. trials. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I wanted to um, end our time here. I'm going to read one of these comments from Dr. Pasnick um, uh, for our speakers. Thank you for these talks. I love seeing great critical care trials in a variety of settings. I'm hoping some of this work trickles down to the U.S. system and helps us be more judicious about our resource use. My personal opinion is that we overuse a lot of critical care interventions in the States. And I, I totally agree. I think getting different perspectives helps to make us better. And, and I have to say, it warms my heart that part of the motivation for Clover's was two major trials that were done in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as we wrap up, I, I do want to put in a plug. If you enjoyed this, this way of looking at the data and the evidence by hearing from people and how they interpret it across the globe, um, Chest Critical Care, which is a relatively new journal, is starting a series called Atlas. Um, which actually does just this. It takes experts like this from around the globe and gets their thoughts on interpreting and, and applying trials. So I hope you'll, you'll look for that. Uh, before I close, do any of our speakers have anything else they'd like to add? <laughs>
All right. I will take that as a no, and I'm really grateful. It was a um, wonderful turnout, really, really thought-provoking talks, and really grateful to everyone who participated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy your stay, Kigali. <laughs>